Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. I am now going to, where, what do I read off of? Moderate this little discussion on Conference XP Futures discussion. That's not options trading, that's where we want to go. Um, and so the goal of this is for me to say the least amount and to write down the most, and for you to say the most. So we'll start initially, oh look, we have our little, I'm not Vanna. I don't think so. I mean, I'm not going to put anything up there except maybe bunnies. But um, So let me write down sort of the things that I think we have in, uh, that we could do in the future that apply to Conference XP and collaboration. Um, And you get to see how I can't spell or write because I'm a computer person. Uh, why don't I hold this? So we have four possible places that we could do some interesting things. And I'm more than happy to hear you say, there's 10, let's write down the other six. Um, but this is sort of a place to start. So how can we evolve what's going on with Conference XP, both technically and socially as a community? Um, we could brainstorm cool features or new applications that interact with Conference XP that we think will revolutionize the world and make everyone a happy collaborator. Um, we can imagine um, sponsoring more events that occur sort of throughout the year, programmers. I, I, I think that an interesting point, I don't know where Jonathan went, there he is, um, that Jonathan might not have gotten explained well is the mega conference is sort of the new age version of the old internet bake off um, where people have partial implementations of, of a spec and they come together and they try to force them to work and they realize how to change their solution so that things do interop. Um, I think that's a model that's no longer in vogue in the commercial world. It's much more popular to own the market and not interop. <laughs> um, and so we don't have necessarily the bake-off model anymore. But we actually could in our community because we've got Access Grid, we've got VRVS, we've got Conference XP, we've got InSource, we've got H323 and SIP, and these things at some level could all talk to each other. So we could do things like that, and that might be the kind of event that we sponsor, or a programming boot camp or something. So that's an idea. Um, what other types of services, and I'm taking the slant on services, Todd can correct me if I'm, if I'm too narrow, do we see in sort of the Conference XP and collaboration ecosystem, to borrow that word from the grid world, um, we have reflectors, archivers, venues. Um, what other kinds of services can you see being integrated into Conference XP? Um, and then the last thing would be what other kinds of programs need to be created? Um, You're wrong. <laughs> You're going to use the projectors. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, we'll use those when we break talking. apart, but people in the back can't see. Uh, oh, people okay. People in the front can't read your writing, and people in the back can't see it. <laughs> <Well>. <laughs> That's how these things go. Um, all right, so uh, programs are things like uh, new initiatives that we should start, either as a community or through sponsors, to do interesting things, whether it's development, deployment, uh, engaging strategic interests. Um, some of the ones that are uh, near and dear to my heart are things like uh, rural health care and education, um, but also trying to beat up the mesh networking world as a way to do a technology leapfrog for rural network connectivity. 
So you can imagine doing some nifty, cool things there to maybe network enable some really crazy, scary part of the world and see what happens socially. Um, but you could use that same technology for doing, is this on and alive now? Or is Jason going to be my secretary? But he's going to write, right? No. The handwriting problem won't get fixed that way. <laughs> but everybody can see it. Okay. They can, see, they can all see equally how messy it is. So I'm about done saying introductory comments. And um, if you don't do things like start offering up suggestions in these four areas, I'll just randomly pick you, drag you up front, and embarrass you into submitting some idea. Because that's why Todd asked me to do this. Um, Parallels. We have a way to do that. Caveat, caveat, caveat. <laughs> so, uh, are we just listing these, or are we going to? Uh, yeah. Uh, why don't we get a list first, and then go to the discussion at the uh, at afterward? Okay, we'll go into the the technologically simple solution cross-platform conference XP. Um, decent map traversal uh, uh, for the left over. I'm just. Let so me rephrase that. Decent, uh, I'm sorry, map traversal at least for the reflector. Yes. Okay. And I'm uh, editing it to remove the qualitative. Decent's awfully hard to measure. Could you explain what you mean by subrooms? Well, you know, each house. So, we just don't lay down. You go into a bindi city, you log on, you can get a whole bunch of things. You can go into, you click on your stress, move to that particular room. How about instead of that, being able to have the ability to go into subrooms? Okay. Rather than have just have a huge portal. Yeah, we, I think we've historically on the AG site called that venue topology. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not just a flat list, yeah. it's sort of a complicated graph of things. Okay. So multicast, yeah, it's, it's a pair of functionality <laughs> pieces, right? There's the detection and the correction. How does Evo work? Sorry, go ahead. Evo has wonderful uh, visual representation of, of diagnostics in the network. So evil like diagnostics and status. It's not going to get prettier. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's not writing. He'll love me if I write with this. <laughs> so it's up there. Um, I, I'll, I'll yeah, let you fight with it you while I, Yeah. So uh, Evo style indicators with those kinds of diagnostics. I think we've got other examples too with, you know, that guy who wrote that beacon internet detective thing, you know, had some data. Um, <laughs> And then the second one is to evaluate the impact of CXP in those settings. Can you say that one again? Evaluate the impact of CXP or using CXP ap applications of that platform in educational se settings. Uh, I think only then we can get people to use it. And then the third one <laughs> is to improve the services of CXP for tracking and assessment. Uh, right now the archival service only tracks, for example, raw data only record logs the raw data. 
would be nice to have higher semantics, higher, higher label of, of information tracked and archived. But you mean, when you say tracking, I come from a 3D virtual reality world where that means electromagnetic three-dimensional tracking. You mean actual, like, through a process, of, through the educational process? Uh, or no, through an either. instructional... The, itself, for example, right now, the archival service logs everything. Right. But there's just, it logs only the raw data. But a lot of the other things, they can be... So the interpretation of yes. the interpretation of the research, basically. Yes. I don't know. But are you looking at that as a, uh, do you consider that something some core feature you want built into conference XP, or do you see this as an, an add-on for the educational assessment community? I think core. Core. This is in the Okay. XP. And then, I have a couple more. Mm -hmm. uh, another one is allow instructors or administrators of educational administrators to embed some sort of pedagogical strategies or knowledge bases into CXP. Uh, this is because I see CXP. If you want to use CXP in, in pop, you say K twelve schools and different instructors have different instructions, in, in different strategies of how they should deal with the classroom, and different schools have that too. And they probably would prefer to customize CXP to the needs. And we cannot developers cannot do that for all possible objective and all all these different options. So it would be nice to have to CXP itself has that kind of competency or that kind of interfaces for those instructors. And finally, uh, should have a, are you familiar with SCORM, the SCORM yeah. standards? And I see for them from yesterday and today, there are so many capabilities, CXP capabilities being built. And I, if, if this widespread use of CXP is going to take off, I say in five years, a bunch of C CXP capabilities lying around, we do need some sort of metadata standard so that it's easy, much easier to organize them, much easier for people to, oh, to use them, plug and play, things like that. Uh, so this, so this, my five, five, five things. Sorry, let me go back to this, the, the one prior to that. Okay. Uh, you were looking for templates or specific capabilities related to different pedagogical styles being implemented in Conference XP? Yes. Is that what that was? Yes. Okay. Just in the, the metadata, I think it's actually even uh, it's more important to actually identify the components of the content itself that's produced by uh, Conference XP usage um, so that we can get a handle on what kind of metadata would be important. I mean, it, again, it becomes, uh, this is a key point. We're, we're working with the technology, but what we're doing is we're creating content. And in, in the end, that content is going to be king. And to the uh, amount that we can actually make that searchable and repurposable, um, if it's built into the core technology, then it becomes easy to do. And that becomes, that actually generates a snowball effect. Okay? Because. Give that to me again. Start. Give me. All right. I think I followed it, but I need a bullet point to put up here. Okay, we need to identify the metadata it's for the content that has been produced uh, by the archival system in uh, in Conference XP, and that could be for a variety of different applications or uses of Conference XP. But bottom line is, it's content. Okay. For the software, for the resource to try and implement the software. And it's around multitask. When we started using it almost two years ago, the biggest problem we ran into was multitask. And then you Thank called. God today that's no longer an issue. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> when we started working with the folks in Ireland, the biggest problem they ran into was multitask. So, so my question is, is there someone, whether it's in Microsoft or just a, just a resource or group of people available who are multicast knowledgeable that can be called on to answer some of those network questions? I know I can't. I, I don't know much about it. That, that is a I2, it's a uh, multicast work group. Um, 
the acumen list and uh, a lot of very knowledgeable people on there who you can pose questions to and people will respond. So let's talk about the specific one and maybe the generic version of that. So the specific one is there's a common set of problems people are encountering with any advanced system and, and particularly with Conference XP uh, in terms of deployment. Uh, we should be able to identify, since this is a global community, inter uh, online resources of some sort to be able to help with that. So multicast is obviously the one that, that probably comes up most, uh, most frequently or, or generically we should just say networking. Um, and are the resources Microsoft can bring to bear there? Um, uh, but in the in the larger sense, um, uh, can we identify you know the top ten types of things people actually need assistance with in deploying Conference XP and make sure that there is some available resource for that? And I, is that a reasonable summary of? Your and I think that that could be rolled up into in a strategy, which is um, maybe we have a turning point in the Conference XP life cycle today that that is we've got a lot of this expertise in the community um, if we I mean we did this with the access grid we went through a cycle like this right the first five years of the access grid we had a full-time person at Argonne funded to travel around the world and make multicast work that's a really expensive solution ask Bob <laughs> it also doesn't work because you make a change for six months and that doesn't mean it stays but as a group, we can do things like through the RTC advisory group, right? Real-time communications are going to, to some level, depend on having these technologies deployed and supported in a production environment. So we can start encouraging our IT staff and our CIOs to at least consider these things in their three to five year strategic plan while doing what we have to as a community to get through it. Richard? So since we're talking about networking now, it seems that on the Conference XP side, the critical thing is to have better diagnostics available to quickly narrow down the problem. Yeah, I think that relates to some of the points over here. I, I wanted to interject one other comment on your behalf, um, which is probably as important as identifying the metadata of the content we're creating
system set up that you, know, you just push a button and suddenly that cohort group is encrypted, particularly for use in um, medical or you know, the requirements outside of the US for transmission of some of this data are, are quite significantly different and require the use of encryption. It also needs to be a security system that can work all over the world without requiring a violation of ITAR or <coughs> any government's yeah, regulations in terms of high-grade crypto. Well, let's say many governments. I don't think we're going to hit the any governments, but well, it, it, there are different requirements around the world. So yeah, some sort of standard security system that is yeah validatable for the cohort that use it. Right. Um, but is open and standard so that you, know, we, you can do a conference with China without worrying about you know, violating international laws. Right. So, simple way, so one, some basic security functionality. Yeah. Two, a simple way to do group sorts of things uh, uh, instead of everything that we got now, which is basically at the individual or venue level. Yeah. Okay. We call that my posse. Eric? How about Okay. <laughs> so uh, that was a, a good job. Uh, a, a couple things. We avoid. So, so we took some decisions early on about things we weren't going to include um, because of the model we took. So, for instance, there's no scheduling in conference XP today um, for any number of, of, of perfectly good reasons. But at the end of the day, we decided, and this is how we do ours internally, we schedule conference XP rooms or venues as physical things. So they're a part of our Microsoft uh, 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 directory. And the rooms where we're, we're going to schedule things, we associated a room with the venue, and that's where we, uh, uh, where we scheduled. So there was no need to create another system. We just used the internal one. Um, now, there are several people who came back and said, well, that's great for you internally, but it doesn't really help with uh, uh, third parties. But in a way, it does, because we still scheduled that physical room, which is, uh, has a virtual uh, uh, equivalent uh, on the venue server. Um, and everything worked the same way. I still sent an invite to external people to be held in this venue um, that I control. Um, so for going the security things for a moment, that was a, a, a trivial solution. We just said we're going to map physical uh, physical rooms to actual venues, and that's where we're going to tell people to meet. Um, and that solved, solved, solved two problems. One, a lot of people who actually wanted to be physically present just to go to the room. Um, and at the same time, uh, uh, made it trivial to use the same name for the uh, uh, virtual venue as well. Yeah, well, I think it works. It works for using it like that. If you say, you know, it's going to be sort of a, a meeting thing, and we'll schedule it, and we'll schedule it like a room. But, but I think there's room to innovate there. And I think that there room, you know, there's room to find different ways of doing it. To okay. It so we certainly had a lot of requests for ad hoc sorts of things. Hey, I've got five people on my buddy list, and I like to jump together into a virtual, into a virtual session. Uh, uh, that's been a, a fairly common request and something we're playing with the, with the early SDK for, for Messenger, for instance. Can you give me an example of, uh, are you just saying more experimentation with novel uh, 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 novel models to replace venues? Is that what you're looking for, or? It, it's, uh, it's, so the high level suggestion is, is think not just about sort of feature requests like diagnostics and we'll see if you've got multi cast, but also think about doing some, some radically different things that really make conference Vista look a lot different than the Let me give you a suggestion for the room. The truth is, if you can whip up a multicast group, you can have a meeting in any room that you want. That's beyond the realm of most of the people that we hope are using Conference XP. So how about something where you have a pool of multicast addresses that your Conference XP administrators and you can set up a room by grabbing one of those that's not currently being used somewhere else. You can you can sort of create a virtual venue, and and if you want to, and perhaps you can describe some attributes about about that room that the door is going to be closed. It's going to be a private meeting, right, with encryption and such, and, and where you might have some resources that you could dynamically allocate 
the, the truth is, for Ivan or myself, setting up a, a venue for um, Conference XP is, is not a big deal, and you can say, well, use the venue server manager. But what if you had some some floating rooms um, that that you might take advantage of, uh, and you could have, you know, five multicast addresses that are just in this pool to be used for, you know, our hallway meeting. Okay. Uh, and, and those sort of things. Would it, would it be, uh, let, me, let me try this within the current context to make sure I'm following this. Uh, uh, this is not to propose that this is a solution, but to see if I've, I've got what you're saying right. Um, would an example be uh, if we set up a dedicated venue server that's uh, the ad hoc server, you know, one room one, two, three, four, whatever, with a list of multi uh, multicast addresses, and if we had the ability to tell whether a room was currently in use? Is that sort of the functionality you're looking for? Get the, the fact that I described it that way. Is that what you're uh, what you're suggesting? Well, or, or maybe you have a venue server that that there are no venues listed there. They're created on the fly. You create them on the fly, and it, maybe it's Bob's room. And if you're going to come into Bob's meeting, you have to have a key to get in the door if it's a private meeting. Got it. So. And, and there's no reason, for instance, if we know we're all going to be meeting virtually, that we have to schedule a physical resource. And therefore, any ad hoc virtually assigned address with security uh, is the way to do it. Yeah, that, that would be an innovation. Yeah, and, and, and showing, having some translucency about what's going on <coughs> on the menu server would be kind of cool. I mean, if you look at really successful online communities like, you know, Wikipedia, MySpace, you know, if you even hit the front page, you mean chaos. You look at chaos. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, you know, you, you can tell that there's stuff happening. If you log on into a venue server, there's a list of venues. You can't tell if they're in use. You can't tell if people have been using it. Sure. Just, if just people are in session, with yeah. giving, no, giving a feeling of light. Now, that, of course, requires that your venue server actually be a part of and monitor multicast sessions to know whether there's activity. It takes active participation to have those indicators. Mm -hmm. I think that's not necessarily true if you just use some kind of a HTTP request response to tell the venue server kind of what you're doing. You enter a venue, you tell you the venue server. You some protocol things to, I mean, to mitigate the, like that's pretty easily the work, but I mean, as we know from AG stuff, you either have complicated protocol or you have active listening. I mean, you ha it's sort of a trade-off one or the other. Otherwise, you get a lot of people who enter the meeting and no one leaves. And so it's really busy as time goes on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, there were a bunch of them, but I'm going to start over here again and just go around. Well, it, it goes back to the MySpaces. Why, did, why does IAM and MySpaces really work? I think it's, it goes back to what Todd said, is that it's simple and easy to use, but it's also free for people to do. You know, and, and the notion is, should we actually set aside some bandwidth, some resources across the world that are dedicated for use for people to use freely how they choose. Yeah. So, so my quick response is to that we have that today. Anybody can set up a venue server. Okay. Don't have to tell anybody else. Don't have to register anything. You have the complete ability to do it yourself, and, and lots of people have. I mean, right now, conference the 4 beta, which we started tracking numbers of downloads on, um, we get about uh, 20 to 25 downloads per week of all four components. That's a lot of people setting up and doing stuff that are not bothering to tell us or notify us or uh, do anything unless they happen to have a problem and show up in the forums. Um, so I have a model today to allow anybody to do that. What I don't have is a model today for someone to do that in an ad hoc fashion um, with other people unless they let them know about the venue servers and, and how to get on and everything else. So it would be nice that if they simply installed the client, anybody, there, anybody on their buddy list, for instance, to then initiate a, a, a group secure ad hoc session. And that's something we, we don't have today. So I'm, I'm definitely going to look at that. It, it hooks back into the same global awareness problem right. of knowing who, who else is using the system, who's available for you to talk to. And I actually think a model for innovating, Eric, that would be really kind of crazy would be, um, you know, the, the venue service is fairly lightweight. It's not actually all that big. You could imagine having an ad hoc version of the venue service embedded in the client. And when I call you, what the, my call, my let's meet, is basically sending you the endpoint of me for us to connect point to point. And in that model, it gets interesting in looking at things like handhelds, you know, kids running around on campus, um, 
devices that have been optimized for simplicity but have enough multimedia features to say, okay, we've got a group of people running around doing something and they've built their own little network of people doing stuff and, you know, what does that look like? What, how are they using it and what do we need to change? And so, Gino's actually was, let me get him quick because. This is very short. Yeah, you, you have a thing to care about contents XP SharePoint. Yeah. yeah. Right after you that, either in parentheses or, or as a sub did you click uh, file syncing? The SharePoint group, I tried to show that yesterday. It was a little funky, but it works really well. I think Conference XP could benefit from this. So we'll separate two things here on, on this particular one. This is about Conference XP as a community site, yeah. as opposed to the use of, I'm sorry, SharePoint as a community site, as opposed to SharePoint within, as, as you use it today, a particular use. Uh, yeah. yeah, you're right. Particular That's use. why I said a sub right. OK. Eric? Well, yeah, with regard to SharePoint, I can imagine that there's many more features that you can uh, integrate between the two. And, and in relationship to the templates that were mentioned, we are, there are already some SharePoint templates for specific, specific ways to collaborate. It would be nice to have those in sync as well. And one other thing in relationship to other Microsoft products, uh, we haven't talked much about live meeting yet, and I understand it's going to take a while before it will do much real-time stuff. You probably know more about it. Um, but I could imagine that there is interaction there too, like uh, watching video streams from a conference XP session in a live meeting, vice versa, and stuff like that. So let me do it, uh, see if I can state that generically. An interest in any type of integration between conference XP and the rest of the Microsoft RTC components, Messenger, live meeting, uh, live server, live communication server, office communicator. Is that, is that a... Yep. Okay. I, I would, from a non-Microsoft status, I would uh, just caution our community to not believe too deeply that there's a coherent future plan for competing technologies within the confines of Microsoft. I mean, we don't know, right? So, you know, IBM as a counter example or as a supporting example may have five groups building the same technology only to compete them internally and four of them die. I'm not sure any of us outside of Microsoft have the depth of knowledge to predict which of the products we should be strategically aligning with. I would, I would think we, what we want to do is something like what Gino's saying and go, what's the functionality we want, right? And figure out who can provide that functionality today, not worry about a specific implementation or a technology or tool. I mean, I think collaborative integration with scheduling and sort of ad hoc groups. I think the telephony integration is a really interesting technological piece. Um, how that's done, I don't care, right? I want people to call in from their Blackberries, sort of. My eye's twitching because it's stressful. But um, anyway, I think that's a, a way to characterize the, the question that may be a little more abstract. I think the ability to do site count conferencing would be uh, interesting. Uh, I'm involved in a main conference. I decide to have a site discussion with someone, but I want to have, or three people, and I want to have that, you know, in the same context and be able to actually just connect with them. Archived or not? Archived or not like archived? Actually, I would like it archived locally, but in order to do yeah. that, you would need to have some type of a distributed timestamp that was maintained so that it could be resynchronized with the original conference. You know, but that's not something you should hard to do. So, look, look, uh, if I can uh, take a divergence for a moment, one of the things Jason and I have argued before about was I am type of capability within Conference XP. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a there's a rudimentary one that was created as part of a, a demo work that uh, Jason had done that grew into what we have uh, have today. Um, and I've sort of argued in the nine years that I've been dealing with the academic research community against reinventing the wheel um, or uh, as little as possible, unless of course you need to port it to Windows because it's not available on the platform yet. Um, but on the IM side of things. Uh, the access grid, I think, took a reasonable approach, which said we're not going to create IM for uh, the access grid. We're going to rely on existing things, in this case, Jabber. And that was a, a, an alternative solution that worked very well, well-supported, mature clients. Um, and, there, and some folks were looking at a little bit of integration work, but basically said, uh, 
that's too mature, we're not going to worry about it. As long as we can find some way to coordinate it with this, the AG session, then that's good enough. Is there a general feeling about whether IM is, has matured enough that we should be able to use that within, with something like Conference XP, uh, outside of, out, but outside of Conference XP? I think you should be able to use it as part of one of the tools with, within the, within the uh, people that are involved in the conference with the participants. But what I'm talking about is not reinventing the wheel. I'm talking about having a site conference, but you're using all the data that, uh, of the people that are in the conference to select that. You, so you're creating, uh, if you will, a virtual conference on the fly. Yeah, I, I think a good example that we've used that's chat. No, that's technologically beyond what we can do today is imagine everyone in the room, we have the room mics, but right. imagine everyone also has a Bluetooth headset connected to their laptop. Right. Now, what you want to effectively be able to do is lean over with your Bluetooth headset and whisper to someone at another location and have a private conversation in the context of the group. So that's pure audio, no text. And it's not necessarily. See, the problem with IM is is most of the conferencing that they that they have is, I mean, not beyond chat because we're not talking about text. Is sure. is, is one to one, and you don't want that. Okay, so you, you are want looking, an in way. But you're looking at audio for this, or audio or, or video and audio. I don't think you should limit it. I mean, it, it could be multimedia, but it's a, it's a subcontext of the mm -hmm. collaboration that you want to be able to create dynamically and. And given our challenges at even doing multi-channel audio, that could be, it's a technology hurdle we have to leap. Um, you've been waiting a really long time. Support for a sub-conference session within a conference XP session, is that what you're looking at? Yeah. Uh, you know, a quick private breakout sort of thing with, okay. Yeah. Okay. Session. Session. Yeah. It's a new word. <laughs> Microphone. It goes with IntelliSense. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a second. He's speaking next. Right. <laughs> I, I, I actually, uh, you mentioned earlier, Eric, about um, uh, thinking of new ways for this thing to work. So what, what, what if you could do it like I am, where um, I want to have a, a, a talk with you, so I call you up, and you and I, are, you and I have a meeting, and, it, and we don't care what the venue is. We don't even know. Something else figures that out. It just shows up. Now we've got two machines. We have two pictures, and then we want to add somebody to the meeting. So uh, we get a hold of Eric, and we add. We just add him, and and um, which venue server you're actually using is figured out by something else. You never see him. You don't even care. You just people get to be part of the meeting if you add them in. They just. Show up. I'm going to use this because it's important. Okay. Is that doable? Say it one more time, please. Okay, so instead of picking a room and then sending email to everybody or calling them up on the phone and saying, hi, we want to have a meeting in this room at this time, yeah. then you just you just basically, with, with Conference XP or whatever, or an integrated thing in with IM, you, you send a you send a note to somebody to connect with them, and then they connect with you, and you have now you have a conference XP meeting one on one, and then you want to add another person, right? So you invite this other person, and they show up, and you invite somebody else, or they invite somebody else, and and so the where the venue server is and where the room is doesn't matter. Right. It was created for this meeting, and it yeah. goes away. When so when okay, they, so we're, we're looking at one ad hoc and two, a different invitation initiation protocol. Much the so same way as you would do a conference call. You call somebody up on the phone and you dial somebody else and you add them into the sure. call. But we have so it, and, and we have that capability today in IM. So if yeah, you've got a two-way exactly. two yeah. IM session going, you can, add you somebody can say, to it. invite someone else to participate so, if they're so on. You, so you pitch conference XP technology into that and now you have a tool that does everything and you just add people in and you don't care what room you're in, you're meeting, and then when you're done, the room goes away. So let me suggest something. Since we're all using IM today, what if we just made this an add-on to IM? I think you. I think you missed. If we use IM as the execution, as the as the medium for doing that, as the interface, as the interface. Because I, I mean, yeah. the problem that, I've got right I'm now talking, is I'm running. Yeah. I'm running three IM clients. Today. Yeah, yeah. That's I don't want to add another IM-like capability. But if I could, if I could add this capability into uh, yep. into Windows Messenger and Jabber, for instance. Um, uh, that would cover a large portion. I think of it's a modality issue, and I think that's a solution. And in the the okay. little graph that I drew up here. Um, the graph chart is in a lot of the computer mediated uh, literature and it and it tries to show that we have different ways that we interact and some of them are transient and some of them are permanent and some of them are synchronous and some of them are asynchronous and we have different artifacts that we use in these different 
ways that we do things. For example, in Gino's classroom model, where you're using SharePoint for syllabus and homework and stuff, you, that, you don't want that to be transient. That's, that's working against the effort model that makes sense. Um, but I think that the interactive sort of ad hoc is probably uh, a modality or a usage of the technology that isn't as rich today. So it may be that what we want to say is, like having pedagogical templates for Conference XP, we want to have some modality flexibility in how we do that, whether it's as an IM plug-in or whether it's a handy make it work on your smartphone or you know whatever happens. We need to look at the different ways that people interact and support a broader range of those interactions. Does that, is that a fair way of? Yeah, I, I suppose. I mean, you know, if, if I have a, a meeting every week, I'll book a conference room, exactly. and it'll just be there every week. And people know, everybody knows they have to be in there at a specific time, and the meeting lasts for an hour, and, and that's it. Right. Um, but see, the, 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 the whole the whole concept of the rooms and the venue service, is, is, it's all based on <clears throat> the way we do business, the way we book conference rooms, the way Access Grid worked. It's, it's the way we've done everything. We don't necessarily need to keep doing that because we don't care what room we go in to have a meeting. And unless, right. if it's a conference room, one room might have a better screen than another room where it might be warmer in there and not as cold or something. But in a virtual room, who cares? You, you, don't, you just don't care. All you want to do is get people together and talk. So it just seems like if the interface could allow that to happen, we didn't have to think about scheduling a room. It just happened. No, I think that's, that's a great use. I mean, our original scenario was more about fixed locations rather than mobile and ad hoc, yeah. um, and more about high-end, you know, multi-display, multi-camera uh, types of things rather than low-end. But it's clear there seems to be a, a big demand for this type of capability. I'll be honest with you, I think that demand would go away if IM today supported multi-party audio video, even the lower quality that they did. I think there'd be much less less interest in this. Uh, but, but people don't, uh, but you require a much larger infrastructure for that under IM, <coughs> dedicated hardware from Polycom and so on, um, then what you need with Conference XP, which is just the PC. So I think you could do that kind of interface even with a large room and high-end video as well. I think you could do it no matter what. Oh, you could. I'm just saying those yeah. types of resources are typically scheduled. The room has to be scheduled. Right. The physical room has to be scheduled. That's right. Is this a place to throw in the, if you're one of those people that got invited in the session he's describing and you're sitting at the airport with your wireless laptop, that you should be able to join to the limits of the capabilities you have, which means you maybe get the audio and you get a slow frame rate uh, pictures, but you don't get any video. How, how did Jason, how could we, we, how could we do that? Could we, uh, any ideas, Jason? On what we uh, ports come to mind. Ports yeah. come to mind, yeah. so RTP spec compliance. Yeah, something like that. So yes, spec compliance common, is a good Common thing. discussion that we have, there was an original design decision to simplify things by sending thing, everything out on the same port, and it did simplify things. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, uh, it's a, it's a real limitation uh, to what we can do, and, and, and one of the things that we've listed as a, as a priority. Uh, uh, we, we've seen over and over we try to use this in terms of some management things, that somebody's at an airport or yep. somebody's in a car. No. They're, well, they're Mike's example of this is he started to, uh, using Conference XP for some of, uh, uh, of his organizational meetings, and there's always somebody who wants to dial in. Yeah, so we're back to the, you know, here's a Gettner for $4,000 to do it, or a $30 club Win card is built in, <laughs> in software. Um, so that's one of the things that we're, we're doing. But RTB spec compliance is the thing that will enable us, and, 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 and individual port use will enable us to uh, uh, support that. Scenario. And I'd add my two cents worth again about my enthusiasm for, for document cameras as an alternative to the tablet. Although I love the tablet, I write better on a piece of paper, and I also don't want to send that as video. And, Todd knows the work, but uh, right. No, it's been on, on my list. I haven't pulled up the list that I had started originally on this, but I'll, I'll add that at the end. So. Um, just more on the presentation tool. Just, just a couple of things which may um, maybe good to add for the functionality is um, the ability to uh, save uh, presentation once it's been um, um, whether you've got any particular ink that's been added to it, or, or be able to export it to a PDF or uh, JPEG or so forth. And also the ability that um, once a presentation has started, that um, if further people were to join late or to, to join in that, that was to be able to be uh, automatically put up for them. These are the small things, but um, uh, I just noticed them, you know, in, in meetings as well. That, you know, usually, yeah, if late joiners come, we have to stop no, the presentation yeah. or start again. And is that the one we have the code for that we haven't checked in yet? 
No, no. So, there, there are no unchecked in code. So, uh, there are, actually, there are. But actually, as far as for saving goes, in uh, 4.0, you can have presentation as your presenter tool and be receiving into uh, OneNote on your own machine as your viewer. Okay. So, you're not actually. Okay, so that you use the OneNote. Yeah. But that's, that's capturing a presentation that doesn't give you the ability to play it back later. Well, that's so, the archive or something. Right. You want it save. So presentation, yeah, right. no, our presentation fine. doesn't have save. Or you've got to just simply print it out, run in the room, and give it to the participants who are looking at it. Say, I did say, email it to them, say it to them. Basically, yeah, you know, I just noticed in the meetings that, you know, it's going to people go, oh, you know, once they've seen the presentation or they've made the, the notes to it on the tablet PC, they want to go just physically take it away from the room or to be able to just have an email to them. Yeah. You're doing some of this, right? Well, we have multiple students who look at presentations across the pond, we asked that one note be kind of like the, the common thing. And on our end, we have them as one note sections, and they receive them as one note sections. So those are, those, those are. <coughs> Quick poll, how many people here who, uh, who are using Conference XP are using one note as well? Um, how many people would like a copy of one note to be able to play with that capability? Okay, so as part of the follow-up from, from this event, when we, when we send you the information about the camera, we're going to, you know, which camera you want in that, I'll also give you a checkbox to ask if you'd like a copy of, of OneNote, and we'll, we'll send that out. Um, do, you, do we know the date for release for Office 2007 yet? So we'll send the current one, and we'll upgrade you to 2007 when that comes out. Eric, were you going to say something when I shut you down? Oh, yeah, I was just going to clarify that there's some kind of concession for great houses in a good way. Uh, but, but I think it would also be nice to be able to do unitask streams between individual participants. So, so in addition to sort of the breakout sub meeting, if in the middle of the talk I wanted my, you know, large group audio to, to run the drop and then send an audio stream, and maybe just might be sounding like Ivan, it's a stretch I know. Um, <coughs> okay. So, isn't, uh, as Jeff said, I'm sorry, I, I was writing at the same time that you you started that out. Isn't that sort of what we wanted with, you know, being able to hold a subconference within? Um, that was the question. I couldn't tell if the subconference was to prior to separate uh, multicast address and some group of participants. Oh, I wasn't looking at it as a separate multi. I was looking at it as a multi, a different subcast address. I was looking at it as a capability that will be ignored unless you're invited to participate in it. Via well, there's, there's, there's a small continuum that we defined way long ago, which is sort of the global yeah. collaboration. And then you can decompose that n into n pairwise conversations, but in the middle there is what we called, and for lack of any education at the time, caucus mode, right, where you actually can subdivide into little small groups in the context of the big collaboration, and you have, you know, four-way, five-way breakout sessions, um, but they're not location-specific. So those subgroups span the distance as well. Right, you have a, lo a global group that spans the distance, you have subgroups that span the distance, and you have pairwise conversations that span the distance, regardless of you know, the context. The whole context can be one thing, and that tries to capture sort of the different meeting interactions yeah. that, that happen. Yeah, like, I, I, I think they just heard something else when I understood something else being written down about what's happening. Well, I think that was a specific comment about that lowest level of specificity. The notion was that it not be limited to one to one. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, that could include that. Yeah. I'm, I'm confused. Does Eric want this capability to make a snarky comment to you about someone or about you? About, about me to okay. someone. Oh, well, I'm in favor of that. Well, Which, you know, because it's me, he actually is allowed to do that out loud. So if we can take about five minutes and, and wrap this portion of this up, I'm going to summarize all of this, plus the stuff we've gotten off the wish list uh, aliases on the, uh, on the support forums and so on. And, and as, as part of the follow-up for this, I'll send it around to everybody, and, and we'll see about whether it makes sense to try and stack rank these or uh, uh, prioritize them some way. Jonathan, you know, did you get, I missed some of this, did you get shibalizing? No, did not get shibalizing. No one's there? Uh, so or, I guess. Or the Microsoft version. No, well, uh, so this kind of falls back to the, the standard, we don't have any security in the product today, what's the right thing to do? Um, so uh, I think it's a fairly straightforward exercise, and all you're going to do is use, you know, basic crypto and some type of a, either password for that would be fine, or 
some uh, simple type of global <laughs> authentication mechanism like Live or Liberty uh, uh, would work. Um, but again, it, uh, one of the things we're going to talk to uh, this community about is what are your priorities? Kerbo 6509, how much security do you need? Um, uh, we heard from Andrew, obviously, on the international side. As soon as you talk, start talking about exporting crypto, that causes all kinds of problems. Um, so uh, I, I'm kind of looking to the education community to come back and say, here's what we're going to need uh, to deploy this within the, the university to research. And, and I would argue that uh, our group, independent of this, the RTC group, um, should actually be engaging that question on behalf of this project but other ones considering the fact that um, there's, a, 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 there's a strong advantage to integrating with your campus identity management should you have one, um, and your campus authorization framework should you have that as well. Um, but for I, I too to recommend that that be something Internet2 certified, I refer to that as certifiable um, institutions comply with, could affect international collaboration because of the security implications of the technology the campuses adhere to. And so before endorsing necessarily a technology, we should be considering these international situations um, in what our recommendations well, are. We just run Windows and Active Directory. And we... Yeah, see, <laughs> if we were a for-profit, we could say that. <laughs> Applies something like what we do in performing arts, but uh, I'm, first a question to Jason: When you have the sound hooked up on uh, Conference XP, do you, are you hooking up to MME, WDM, or can you do any any kind of hookup with the sound driver? Uh, from my understanding, is that the uh, operating system provides the audio stack, right? So. But could it be WDM? The reason I ask is because some of the equipment we use uh, connected to the computer. Uh, when you have video compressing, the sound is not compressed sometimes, and then the sound arrives before the video. So right. you get a slight <coughs> imbalance with the, with the transmission. One of the ways around that would be, would be to support ASIO, the ASIO audio drivers, because you can actually dial in the latency. You can put the latency as whatever you want. Uh, and the other thing would be, of course, to be able to support four channels, six channels, seven channels to be able to do surround sound. And that shouldn't be too hard to do. If you're sending a compressed, that shouldn't be too hard to do. And that would be fantastic for us if you can have, say, a trio or a piano quartet or piano quintet, different mics on each one. And if the prof there are different professors at the other end, they can listen to which whichever instrument they are most interested in. And this is something, again, it looks like the coolness factor, but I think it might be easy to implement it, just sending more audio channels. It's a, uh, is it's it ASIO, ASIO, is that the model? ASIO. It's, it's a it's, rendering it issue. I forgot who developed it. Uh, uh, Steinberg. Steinberg. But it's, uh, it's been used a lot on professional audio uh, uh, gear. Failing that, the WDM model, the Windows, uh, which allows for multi-channel, that's a Windows model, that also would work. We cannot dial in the latency, but it would work for multi-channel. It, it's, a, it's a driver issue, rendering. <laughs> Rendering on the platform. Rendering is, rendering is a given. You get that for free. Well, but the question is, this do you accept inputs and code? Exactly. So we, we do 5.1 channel playback. If you add a no, but the point, the point he's making is that the synchronization of the data coming out is a rendering driver implementation issue. Right. The RTP stack actually includes timestamps for multi-stream synchronization but on the network. This is a client yeah. issue. But we want for best fit. Simply right. as fast as you get it in, we put it out. Right. Because anything you do for synchronization automatically implies you're going to slow something down. Um, and that was just unacceptable for Well, that's true. But if the push comes to shove in our end, I, I fixed the, 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 the synchronization problem by uh, adding a delay on my software. <coughs> so even if we cannot use us, ah, like so if you prioritize synchronization over latency, then that's yeah, great. Exactly. Yeah, so we can fix it. There is a workaround. But Sending multi-channel is not some. I haven't found a way of being able to do that yet. Nobody has. Richard? So on the original list that you also had events as one that you want feedback on. I would love that. So one thing I think would be very neat would be to have a semi-regular research seminar on Conference XP. 
So the type of talks that we've been having at this meeting, mm -hmm. maybe once a month, yeah. done on Conference XP, bringing up current research. And the two motivations are, for the, are first of all, to build the research community. And the second motivation, which might be the stronger one, is so that we feel the pain. Yeah. Like, use the tools you're building. Yeah, eat your own dog food. Eat your own dog. Yeah. <laughs> and, and along that line, I would add to the end, instead of just a research meeting, yeah, maybe throw in some ad hoc meetings, you know, uh, a group of people that you just actually experience and have an ad hoc meeting and sure. see see where it hurts. So the access group community pioneered, you know, their, their weekly weekly town, town hall meetings right now. No. Um, and that's weekly several test meetings. Weekly monthly test meetings, meetings, sorry, monthly town hall meetings. <laughs> Um, is, for those of you involved in the AG, is that the model you're looking for, or? Yeah. No, I, no. See, there's that's too structured. Okay. I mean, there, there's a lot of structure into having a meeting, and people can make it arrange and put it in their schedule. I'm talking about uh, doing other events that don't follow that model, that are a little uh, more like what you'd find on on uh, MySpaces or an IM, you know, where it's spontaneous. Okay. So more spontaneity uh, to a meeting, and then. Find out where it hurts. I think there's an inertial problem in that, in the sense that one of the things that you don't generally capture about spontaneous meetings is that they have happened. And people tend, for whatever sociological reasons, not to create spontaneous meetings unless other people are creating spontaneous meetings. Right? And so if somehow you had a way to say, Jason and I had this random Thursday morning conversation about some cool technology we thought would be cool in Conference XP, and at the end of it we could say, click a checkbox and it would show up on the conferencexp.net site as, you know, here was a spontaneous meeting and here were the people and here's a transcript or an archive or here's salient points that came out of it. Um, it might be that that enables a social impetus to sort of just do it more often. You know what I mean? seminars. How about showing some of the applications of this rather than it just being the technologists getting together? Yeah. Did Microsoft would maybe just sponsor some yeah, a particular Conference subject area to and yeah, you know, that gets shown off and tumble sized. <coughs> one of the one of the problems which may come up to with obviously with getting these meetings together is, is the capability of up doing these meetings, you know, if you've got like twenty people linked together. I know we talked um, uh, briefly yesterday about um, getting 15 connections together. Sure, it can be, it can be done, but you know, there are own limitations there as well. And that sort of leads, leads into another question. Is there a way that, um, I mean, would the access credit can actually add nodes to be able to one, support video, support the audio side of things? Will this be a similar, similar model that Conference XP can want to do? So you can add a computer just to focus on the, on the video side of things with it, it's doing the encoding. And then, and uh, yeah, there's nothing that prevents you from, from yeah, within a single session doing that. As a matter of fact, all of our, our, our large lecture rooms are set up that way. Yeah. Purely for physical reasons, it's easier to set up a machine that runs the back display at the back of the room, and then we have a podium machine wired up for uh, for audio and. Uh, well, and some, and some of these technologies. That means, though, that that mean that you'll have three nodes, in a sense, being yourself in that room. Yes. Okay. All right. I mean, I mean, that's. But there's no coordination. They're treated and managed yeah. as individual yeah. machines individual today. Ones. And I think that what, what we were talking about yesterday was it, it may be that there's a point you have to consider coordination and management because things like multiple machines for HD encoding and decoding sure. yeah, should sure. logically be slaved to what the activity that you're doing, yeah. but you, they require their own separate resource. Yeah. Um, and so there may be a management infrastructure that, that may need to be created somewhere. Yeah. How, how likely can we get a client, I mean, and, and the, this is really um, based on the idea of, uh, of actually being able to send out an invite. It doesn't require it's a, it's, it doesn't require an install for a person. Literally, you can just send it out in the mail package, and you know, it's we're going to have a conference, you know, at ten o'clock. Click this link, and you're there. Yeah, so we're not the we're not the passion and it just works. We're not the WebEx. A WebEx model on this, or the live okay. meeting model on this. So if you, if you first time you join a live meeting or WebEx, which are the, the web conferencing uh, solutions that are commercially available today, um, you still have to download their shim, as they call it. Um, and right now, that's about a meg, 1.2 meg 
shim for the basic client. We're a five meg shim, so there's nothing that would prevent us from uh, 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 from from sending it as a link to the including a link to the MSI when you send out a meeting invite. Uh, one of the things we've looked at is that Outlook has a nice extensibility model for for scheduling online meetings that allows you to put in third party types of, of things like online meetings, but. Yeah, but but I, I don't think I can get it much. I, I don't think that getting it down below that is a. Uh, and that's that's small enough. But it's also a requirement on the I think Net 2.0, and that's a that's a larger download. <coughs> you know, so again. we have a solution. Basically, when you uh, everyone is running Vista, we don't have the yeah yeah. So we, we do have a, a problem that we are a heavy a heavy install today, and there are prerequisites. You have to have Windows Media Player 10 or 11. <coughs> Installed. Right. You have to have the .NET 2 time. Uh, I'm sorry, runtime installed uh, before you install our MSI. Okay. Yeah, but you'll need that for hundreds of applications. Yes. Yeah. So. That's true. I just want to try the Vista shim. So. <laughs> uh, so thank you. I will. Uh, one last comment. Go ahead. Um, yeah. Um, sometimes it's um, sometimes you want to use a recorded session to maybe support a live session, or you want to access. Um, a recorded session, uh, but it's it's painful to uh, locate the precise point that you are interested in. So, how about annotating not recording but frames within the recorded sessions, mm -hmm. uh, possibly on the fly, so that in in a way in which you can then search through those annotations and jump straight away to the. Particular point you are so one of the things we thought about was, since this is all in SQL Server and everything's timestamp, that you could do a lot of interesting post-processing on this. For instance, uh, I probably wouldn't want to do it in real time, but if I can extract all of the text out of the presentations and feed that into uh, as pre-data for a text-to-speech, speech-to-text uh, 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 translation utility, we happen to have one of those, IBM has one, several others. Um, that you could get reasonable uh, 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 speech recognition and uh, apply that through the, against the audio stream in a timestamp fashion. So that I could then go back against the archive and say, search for the word dinosaur, and it would come back with, you know, I found four hits at these different timestamps and allow you to jump into that. Um, I was looking at more, you know, the automated speech to text thing rather than adding annotation to it, although the obvious annotation would be any text on a presentation that might be on a screen. At, at a given time, and that's something that we don't have the capability of today. And I actually, there was some there was some work on an annotation server that actually did some of that stuff. Uh, the uh, uh, that basically took the slight changes, right? Right. And uh, made that, like, say, an index into the actual. Oh yeah, we have yeah, a, a Microsoft yeah, about, a PowerPoint yeah. producer does that today. Right. Um, it's not something that we looked at or built into this. But they also have some, you know, I mean, again, some of the audio stuff where you can do, you know, cut out spaces. There's, there's a bunch of things that could be uh, intermixed with the annotation server. Uh, there's even a project uh, in iCampus that's, uh, uh, what is it? Um, oh, gosh. Shakes the Shakespeare project that uh, did some annotation with uh, video on video. Yeah, and so there's a there's a lot of flexibility that can be done with the video that allows it to be, as you're <coughs> suggesting, searchable right. uh, and repurposable. And I think the the way to make rapid progress on that kind of a thing, though, is is to describe in a community context very concretely some of the use cases or what are you trying to do, because there are infinite number of ways to cut this pie. And they've been done for 25 years um, by many people. And so the question is not, can we create a new way to cut the pie? The question is, can we do something that helps a scientist answer a question, or an academic teach a class, or a community get some task done? And so I think you know, focusing on those high-level things can drive a lot of progress very rapidly, because the technology is there. So I'm going to, have to cut, this one, uh, cut, cut this one short. We've, we've got about an hour before lunch and two more sessions the access grid update, and then we're going to break out into uh, brief sections for uh, support and user uh, IT types of stuff and developer-related stuff. Um, but Ivan and I will uh, uh, <coughs> make this list out as best we can and send it around for, for comment 
um, before we find out, figure out a way to do uh, staff ranking and prioritization of these things. So thank you very much. Appreciate that.